We're in Colossians chapter 1 for the third week in a row. We started this book of Colossians as an effort really to continue in what the Word has been really washing us in. And this year, we are being washed in our tendency to feel uh, burdened or doubtful, and we're being pointed by God's Word to all of the reason we have to rejoice in and out of season, as you normally would think of, of why you can rejoice and be excited. And, and today's message, we're going to end with another reason that we have to rejoice, but we're going to start with... Uh, uh, in, in all honesty, it's almost an intimidating passage of, of Scripture to preach because it's all right here. And when we read passages of Scripture with this much depth to how it points us to the person of Christ, let me just say on the onset that this requires meditation and understanding and wisdom to be given to you from the, 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 the gift of God through his spirit. I'm going to do my best to stir up some truth in your heart, and then I want to encourage you just to read the word and let God speak to you about what this says about the God that we just worshiped this morning, the God that we just sang praises to. Uh, as we were singing those songs, I thought, man, the word we're going to read this morning is going to take those songs and just magnify them as to why he is so worthy of our praise. The message title that I came up with based off what we're going to read this morning is called Darkness to Light. And I love this concept that we are people of the light, that we've been removed from the darkness because we are watching darkness and light battle with a front row seat in this, in this time and age that we live in. And so I am so grateful that this is a battle that has been going on and it's a battle that has been won and it is a battle for all of us who believe to rejoice in that we are more than conquerors and victors in the battle of darkness and light. So let's talk about how that battle has been won and how we get to the light. That's what we're gonna talk about this morning, starting in verse 13 where we left off last week. It says this, he's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the, into the kingdom of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He, and this is his son, so this is Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the firstborn over all of creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. In Jesus, everything was created that is visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Jesus and for Jesus. We just got done singing this song, You Have No Rival. And I, I looked out as we were all singing it, a tear came to my eyes because we're proclaiming it. Here's why. Everything that was created that you can touch, that you can experience with your senses, and even the things that go beyond your understanding in the invisible realm that is all around us. It's all his. It was created for him and by him, and you, believer, are a part of that. It says that in verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He has no rival. He has no equal. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. This is what we exist to proclaim and to experience as believers. To know more and more of the truth that we just read as a reality in your life that Jesus has preeminence. And that's the Bible's way of saying that he is above it all. Every single thing in this world and in your life Jesus reigns over. There is nothing that you will experience in this world. There's no relationship that you'll have. There's no possession that you'll have that will ever in reality be greater than God who made it all. In fact, it says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of light. It's all his, and we belong to him. And part of this, he, Paul is going to now describe how he teaches us the revelation of what I just preached. Some of you listen to me preach this, and you say, amen. Just sang it, just proclaimed it, just had my heart filled with joy because of it. And others of you are thinking, I'm not so sure. How do we get there? Well, let's talk about what we started this with, which was really the emphasis of pointing everything towards Christ, which is that he has the power to deliver us from darkness into light. Darkness is the realm of the world apart from Christ that does not know the revelation of truth that I just proclaimed to you. 
Darkness is this picture of not knowing where you came from and where you're going. Not knowing why you were made, not knowing your purpose. And because of that, like someone walking around in the dark, you're going to come into all sorts of things that stub your toe and hit your head and make you realize that you are, in fact, living in spiritual darkness. And so we're going to look at this in four ways this morning. And one of the ways that I'm so appreciative that the Bible teaches itself And by the way, when you have a question in the Bible, one of the best ways that you can get that answer is by keep reading. And one of the ways the Bible teaches itself is by taking amazing truths and then pointing them back to what Jesus said about them. And Jesus has a lot to say about the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. He says, I'm the light of the world. He said he came into the darkness and the darkness couldn't comprehend him, but it it could not overcome him. So there's this battle that Jesus came to reveal the truth of who God was. That's why it says he's the visible image. This is who God is. You see Jesus, you've got the light of all the universe and how we got here and where we're going that you can see. And one of the ways that Jesus shows us this is a real moment in history in one of his healings that is real and a reality for one man, but it's also symbolic for all of us. And so as we go through Colossians chapter 1, I also want to point us to John chapter 9, where we get maybe the best way that we can learn this by just seeing it. Seeing the way that darkness transfers into light through the healing of one man. And this is the story of that blind beggar. As they were walking through this town, there's a man who's crying out to be healed. And in the healing of this man, we are going to get insight into how God wants to heal all of us, not from physical blindness, from spiritual blindness, so that we can see what he's up to in our lives and in our world. And so one of the ways that we see this in the blindness of this man, his blindness represents darkness, doesn't it? I mean, is there a better picture of walking in darkness spiritually than someone who physically cannot see? And physical blindness is so pictured in the spiritual blindness of our world today. So I don't want to spend a ton of time preaching the reality of the very first truth that I want you to take as fact that there are, in fact, two kingdoms in this world. There is a kingdom of light that proclaims the hope that we have in God, that he's redeeming the world and creating a people for heaven, the new heaven and the new earth. And there's also a part of this world that is unraveling at the seams. There's a part of this world that is giving us a front row seat into the picture of spiritual darkness, not knowing where you came from or where you're going, and the results will be like someone who is blind trying to walk without the proper guidance. And I don't want to spend a ton of time off this because I want you to just think about the world we live in. And I want you to filter the headlines of the news and some of the burdens that you feel from the year that we're living in through the lens of spiritual darkness because that, in fact, is what it is. We are living in a time where darkness is on the rise and we see it in the burdens that people are feeling and the uncertainty of how to respond to all of the challenging times in the darkness of the age that we live in. The darkness is real. The darkness is seen in death and sin and disruption and corruption and all of the hurt and the pain that is being stirred up in our world right now. The question isn't whether or not darkness is real. The question is, how do we get transferred from darkness to light? And that's a question that the disciples have a premise to start with when they say in John chapter 9, as they're walking through, they listen to this blind man, blind man speak. They, the disciples ask Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? In other words, tell us why the tragedy is happening. Surely there's somebody who did something wrong, whether it was his parents or him, and now they are paying the consequences of their f- horrible, sinful lives. Well, Jesus' answer is going to be very interesting, and I want to encourage you with this answer. The darkness in our world right now is because the entire world and each member in it, apart from Christ, is in a fallen state. Jesus says, or the Bible says that we have all fallen short of the glory, the light, the revelation of who God is. We have all taken part of spreading the pain of the dark world that we live in. And Jesus is not going to ascribe this man's blindness to him or his parents. He's going to say, this man was born that way for this reason. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am the world, I am am the light of the world. That's what Jesus responds. It wasn't 
It wasn't the fact that he is being punished for his sin. It, the fact is he was born into a blindness. And there's a reason for it. Why? So that Jesus could show the power that he has to heal darkness. And as you ask your question in whatever burden helps you relate to the sermon, that you are living in a dichotomy of a world, that there is darkness that's pulling at your seams, and there is a king of light who is transferring you into his kingdom, and you're thinking, why the sickness? Why the disease? Why the confusion? Why the worry? Why the hurt and the pain that surrounds my life? And here's the answer that Jesus will give. He wants to use darkness to show you his light. He wants to use the burden of this world and all they have to throw the power of darkness at you to show the power that he has to overcome. Aren't you grateful for the ways that God has used hard and difficult times in your life to show you what he is capable of? Darkness will rock your faith and Jesus will stand up and say, ye of little faith, I have the power to overcome. Darkness in our world is doing a great work to show the incomplete power of darkness and the complete power of God in our day and age. And we are going to see a harvest of people who experience the power of God this year in new and redemptive ways. And I believe it's happening in your life. No one sinned. The darkness is there that the works of God could be glorified. God wants to show you his power in whatever challenge you are going through where the darkness is surrounding you. So in one way, what the darkness allows us to have is a new revelation of the image of God. And that's why what we read is full of the image of Christ. It says darkness to light. Now that you're in the light, you can see the full image of the invisible God in Christ. And now that you're in the light, you get to know the redemptive power of God through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In the light, there's no condemnation because your sins are forgiven. In the light, there is no burden or worry because you have the hope of heaven. In the light, there's no question as to the purposes of God because you know that he loves you, his work has been worked in you, and now you know the purposes of your life is to love one another. That's the light. And the darkness transferring into the light shows you the contrast of the two worlds. I am so grateful to belong to the kingdom of God in a time where the kingdoms of this world are unraveling at the the seams. And I want to be very clear about what the answer is to the darkness of our world. The answer is Christ. It is a new revelation of Christ and Christ alone. It is only God's power that can rescue us from darkness to light. It is by no other name under heaven. That's why it was so timely and sovereign that, God, or that Noah sang the song that we sang, that he has a powerful name. What a powerful name of Christ that it is. That when you see Christ, you understand the light and the revelation of God's plans for this world, including your life. And so we must preach how the darkness is overcome by the light. It is not simply a church or a pastor or a philosophy or an idea. We point all people to the narrow path of Christ and Christ alone. He is our only hope to overcome the darkness. I'm so grateful that we have a wave of college students coming in. I speak directly to you now. I pray and I hope that you will be light bearers in the dark world because you're on the front lines where the two meet. You are on the front lines of what it means to point people to Christ. So let me share a verse with you and with all of us that helps us remember that what God calls us to is something that he is doing in and through us. He is before all things. He holds all things together. His plan for your generation and what he will do to redeem this time that we live in is his power revealed in and through us, but we have to preach him and him alone. Look what it says now in Colossians chapter 1, or excuse me, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let the light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. We have in us treasure in the jars of clay to show that it is all surpower passing that comes from God and God alone. Cling to it. Just as God shed light in the day one of creation, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. In the beginning was Christ, and at his word, 
He said, let there be light, and there was light. And that's how we got the physical creation that we live in now. And I can't help but see a new creation account being given to us in Colossians where there's a new light that God is commanding. And it's no longer simply the light that creates the heaven and the universe. It's now the light that makes the new creation in you. He says that he says that let the light shine out of the darkness in your own heart. So we pray for a brand new revelation of Christ in our world where he would say, let there be light in the hearts and in the minds of people living in darkness, that they would go from the power of darkness and be transferred into the hope of heaven. It happens through the revelation of Christ alone. That's why Paul says he is the image of the invisible God. So what we need to pray for and understand to give thanks to the Father for is that the transfer happens by a revelation of God. And that is why we preach Sunday by Sunday, continually pointing to who God is in our world for such a time as this. Point people to Christ. I point you to Christ. I point you to his word. I point you to prayer. I point you to a new understanding of how to seek him in your life. And as you get a better revelation of Christ, you understand more and more of the rescuing transfer that God is doing in and through your life. It starts with a revelation of Christ. And that's why I'm so adamant that this cannot live in a message, but you yourselves must seek him and find him. And you yourselves must point people to Christ and Christ alone. It is our only hope for the darkness in the day that we live in, pointing people to the light of Christ. Now, there's a second aspect of the, the process that will happen as we read in John chapter Two. Look what happens to the man's life. He's, he is given this strange, this strange kind of moment with Jesus where Jesus puts mud on his eyes. It says in, in John chapter 9, verse 6, we're going to get the power that Jesus alone has, the revelation of what he is capable of doing, that he can give blind man sight. And as this man will later say, who, alone, who can do that but God alone? The power that God will reveal in you will show you that God alone has the the ability to do things in this world that the darkness can never do. And this is what he does. As Jesus says, nobody sinned, but that the works of God could be displayed. And when he said this, in verse 6, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. So we see the power of God on display. This man was born blind so that Jesus could use this moment as a miracle to give the, the symbol and the reality of his power, a symbol that would go much deeper than to one man's physical blindness, but a symbol that is for all of our spiritual blindness. And then he gives a very clear command to this man. He says, now go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and washed, and he came back seen. He came back seen. Jesus has the power to save us. Jesus has the power to overcome darkness. He displayed that in the empty tomb. And Jesus has the power to shed light into our hearts so that we can be transferred into the kingdom of light. And yet, as we see in the picture of this blind man, Jesus gives him marching orders in a response to the power. I mean, you think about the scene. The guy's got spit-filled dirt all over his eyes, and he's got a decision to make about what he really believes about the power on display. Because Jesus says, now go wash your eyes. You go take some action and wipe wipe off your eyes and then see what happens. And he says he does it. So there is a revelation of Christ that is needed. And there is also a response by faith. In the revelation of the preaching this morning, you are going to hear that God loves you, that God died on the cross for your sins, that God overcame sin and death and prepares a place for heaven for every one of us who believe. And then you are going to be given a call to action. If it's true, what do you do about it? If God has the power to remove you from darkness and to give you the hope of eternity, if God has the power to transfer a whole generation of believers into the revelation of what he's up to, what do you actually do about it? Well, one way it says we preach him, we share him, but we also take steps of faith to live out what it means to live in the new creation. And that is something that can be very challenging to do. But every single one of us, as true as I can preach the gospel to you this morning, that we belong to the God of all power, who by his love is transferring us into his kingdom, he also gives each one of us a job to do about it. 
He gives each person who's been born by his spirit a gift to activate that will give him glory and will serve the body, the church. And he gives all of us a, 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 a world that we live in that is surrounded by darkness. And he says, let your good work shine before men that people would glorify the Father. They would see your light and they would shine unto God's glory. So what are you doing in our day and age to respond to the revelation of God? To respond not simply to darkness with fear and anxiety and worry, but as transformative people responding with the power of God to be a light in the world. And I remember when I got transferred from darkness to light, I had a decision to make in my own life. When I really had my come to Jesus moment, I was living right where I wanted to live in the world of darkness. I was living in the Caribbean. You guys have heard my story. The Lord was just just touching my heart, opening up my eyes to his power. I was seeking him and finding him. And as I cried out to him, I, I, I got marching orders to go back to Boise and to learn the word. I, in fact, I, I, I enrolled into the school of ministry and I had my rabbi, Tom Velasco, over there. Uh, but I'll tell you, it was a step of faith. I had to respond to do something about what God was calling me to do. Uh, because in the darkness of the heart that I loved, I was someone who only wanted to live in the tropics in the comfort of my own choosing. <laughs> I was on a beach. I was in the tropics. I had the low bar of responsibility. I was living my life. And God said, go back to Boise. And here's how I know it was the Lord. It was the middle of winter. Go to Boise in the middle of winter when I'm living in the tropics? I trust you, God. I will allow you to transfer me from darkness to light. And if you say go, I will go. And we see it all throughout scripture. God gives a revelation of his plan for someone, and then he says, go. Abraham, I'm taking you to a, a new place. Depart from your father and mother to a land that I will show you. Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Before you have one son, you have a wife with a barren womb, but I will do the work if you believe me. And it says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Your good works is to believe God and respond accordingly. Your good works is to not only understand a revelation of God because he's given you the grace to hear his word preached. He's given you the spirit to tell you he loves you, convict you of sin, and let you know that repentance is met with grace. And he's also giving you a job to do in such a time as this. I was walking in, I saw the, the coloring pages that were passing out for the young people, and it was a picture of Esther. Who knows in the dark time that Queen Esther lived in, the Persian Empire with an edict against her people, the Hebrew nation, her cousin says to her, her uncle says to her, who knows? It might be time for you to lay down your life. You might be here for such a time as this. And I want to say to every single one of you who has touched the darkness this year, you've seen it come into your life and you, like a disciple, say to her, who sinned? Whose fault is it? Was it mine? Was it my parents? Was it my government's? Tell me who to blame. And God says, nobody fault. I want to show my power in the darkness. And then who knows whether or not you were made for such a time as this, that part of the way the revelation of Christ will come into the dark world is by your response of faith. One of the ways that this blind man is going to be used is that he will now confound the wise. A blind beggar will preach to the Pharisees in John chapter 9 in a way that shocks them with truth and reality. And now I want to tell you of the way that we see this play out in the book of Colossians because there is a parallel happening here. There is a transformation happening in the book of Colossians. Paul himself went from blind to sight. He went from persecutor of the church to believing in the church and preaching it and, and founding it. Verse 21, and you who were once alien enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now You've been reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. There is a before and after to your faith. You who were once alienated, you who were once blind, you who were once a far off, you have been won by the death on the cross. And here's one of the challenging aspects of what we are preaching today. The transfer happens through death. 
For you to be transferred from the kingdom of dark to the kingdom of life required death of God himself so that you could live. It required the God of light to be consumed by darkness for three days. And it required him to pay the penalty for your sin so that you could have life and life more abundant. And here's the reality. God says, in the visible image of his son Christ, anyone who wants to be my disciple, live in the new kingdom of light, my kingdom of love, you pick up your own cross. You yourselves also will take part in reconciliation through death. And that is something that now we will see played out in the life of this blind man. As he goes through his own response of faith, he will also have to go through the rejection of the world, the rejection of his world. And at the very end of John chapter 9, we find a very important aspect to what happens to this man's life. This man can now see. Could you imagine going from blind to sight? The newness of life that you now experience, you see everything in technicolor. You see everything that you once only could sense with your smell or your touch. You now see in its fullness, this is you, believer, how exciting the life in God is. And yet remember that we get there with a cross. Remember that the exciting new life in Christ that you have, you went from blind to sight, from burden of guilt and shame apart from God, from forgiveness and newness of life, you see everything in color now, namely heaven that waits for you. And yet it comes with a cross. Listen to what happens to to this man in John chapter 9. As he goes... He's given sight. There's been a miracle proclaimed in his life that brings glory to God. And that is what's happening. And yet there is an old world that he's leaving behind. There's an old system that doesn't have the right way to fit in what happened in his life. So look what happened. Verse 28. Then they reviled him and said, You are the disciple of Jesus, but we belong to Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, Why, this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was blind. If this man, Jesus, was not from God, he could do nothing. God has shown his power through the resurrection of the grave, sight to blind in your own heart. He has the power to give you newness of life. And yet, you know what happens to this blind man? It says in verse 34, And they answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins, and you are teaching us. And they cast him out. He's been removed from his old system. He's been set free, mind you. He's been given newness of of, of life with new sight. But he's also been cast out from the place that he once was. So I want to remind you as believers, and and before I invite any of you to become believers, I want to tell you the honest truth about what happens to your life when you follow Christ. There is bad news that is met with good news. The bad news is you're living in darkness. The good news is there's power to overcome. The bad news is that you are dead in your sin. The good news is you're alive in Christ unto eternity with the hope of heaven. And the bad news is you will be rejected and cast out by the old life that you used to live. And for that reason... So many people reject the revelation. When Christ is preached and the word of God goes out, it goes out like a seed that lands on soil. And Jesus says most people do not respond with a way that bears fruit in their life. And one of the reasons is that some of that seed lands amongst thorns, and those thorns represent the cares of this world. And as I preach to you this morning, And I say you are called to action by faith in response to the free gift of the revelation of love of God through Christ. I do call you to a cross. I call you to go into a world that is dark, that does not love God, and it does not love people who love God. And for that reason, some of us will not respond to the message. Because the college campus does not love God, and you're called to be a light in a way that confounds the wise. Because some of the family members that you once belonged to had a different paradigm of what they thought was the purpose of their life. And you will be rejected. 
In fact, as we call people to Christ, we call them to baptism, and what that represents is you going into the water to die to the world behind you and to come out of the water with newness of life. And so remember, believer, we are being transferred from glory to glory. The transferring's not done yet. We have the guarantee, the Holy Spirit, that seals us to heaven, but we're being cleansed all sorts of ways, and 2020 has been a cleansing year. Don't be afraid if you're persecuted. Don't be afraid if you're cast out or rejected when you stand up for the light as a city on a hill. This man was given sight, and there is nothing that the casting out can do to take that away. He is now ready to live for God. Let me remind you of some words that Jesus says on this matter. Matthew chapter 10. You'll be hated for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute in the city, flee to another, for assuredly I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like the master. But if they called me, Jesus, a, a, a master of the house of Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for is, there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and nothing hidden that will not be known. I pray that by God's encouragement through his word this morning, the spirit of fear will be removed that those of us who try to find a neutral kingdom in this world realize that there are only two. There is the kingdom of darkness, and there is the kingdom of light. There is the revelation of heaven and all that God is doing to redeem darkness to light, and there are those who are still dead in the old creation. Believer, you're a new creation. The old has passed away, and you must leave it behind you. And you must be okay as the world rejects what we preach. And think about what they're rejecting. We preach hope. We preach joy in all circumstances. We preach love. We preach the God who has no sight on all the divisions that we set up through cultures and race and all of the divides that we have in socioeconomics and all the divides that we have with nation states. Jesus says that he's above all principalities. That's what we preach, the God of all unity, the God of all mercy, the God of all grace. Stand firm in the truth that we believe in and let them reject God, not you. May I empower and bold you to preach Christ who saved you. As I prepared this sermon, reading through this, this charge of Jesus, if a city rejects you, flee. If a group of people reject you, move on. You won't get to enough groups of people to be a part of before the return of Christ. There are plenty of people to fellowship and commune with in in the way that you bring glory to God. And as I was preparing this message, I got the great honor with our dear sister Nagme to reach out to some of the, the pastors and leaders who are now living in Turkey through an underground church network extension of Iran. Literally fled Iran for their faith. Their home country, their home cities, their home network was not worth the glory of God in their life. I got to meet with one girl specifically who this month fled Iran and landed in the safety of Turkey where she can now worship openly. But you know what she had to do? She had to go in the cover of night. She had to go through gunfire. She had to go through persecution. She had to go through hardship. And none of it stopped her from proclaiming the joy that she has in Christ. In fact, she said something very important to me. She said, as I was going through this trial, and the darkness surrounded me, as I was being persecuted for what I believed, I fell more in love with God. And going into it, I thought, this is going to be so scary. The darkness is going to surround me, and people are going to come after me, and it's going to be the the hardest time of my life. And you know what actually happened to her life? She grew a deeper love for the God who is transferring transferring her from darkness to light. And she is just an example of the truth of what happens when we leave this world behind us and we follow Christ with everything we have, when he becomes preeminent, above it all. There is nothing that this world can throw at you that is worth losing the revelation of Christ in your life. And that brings us to this final aspect of what happens to this man. He's been rejected and cast out. His own family didn't stand by his side as he was going through this. 
cast out of the religious system of his day. Is there anything scarier for the man of that day? And yet, what happens? In verse 35, Jesus heard they had cast him out, and when they had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. This is a a moment. We use the word worship, and we think, okay, we're about to worship with a song. This is a moment when this man makes Christ preeminent, worthy of everything. I give you my life. You've given me my sight. The whole world now has rejected me, but I give you my life. This is the rejoicing that comes when we fully understand what Colossians chapter 1 is telling us. The God of the universe reveals himself, the fullness of his glory. It pleased him that it dwelled in Christ. And in the fullness of his glory that is dwelling in his son who comes to live among us, how does he reveal himself? What is the image This God that holds everything together, the preeminent one before creation, holding all things together, firstborn out of the grave for all of us to follow, how does he reveal himself? He reveals himself as a God who loves the least of these. He reveals himself, symbolically taking us from darkness to light through a blind beggar. The disciples wanted a revelation of his power that was like military force. Remember those the, the disciples that were asked to go prepare a way for Jesus and they got rejected and they said, Jesus, can we go, can we pray to heaven to cast fire and brimstone down on this town because they rejected you? And Jesus said, Hold on. And I say that because if we want to find the re- worship and the rejoicing that will be an, a, an extension of the revelation. We've got to do it like this blind beggar received it. He didn't see Jesus in the display of power that was military might. Jesus gave him newness of life. Jesus gave a revelation of sight to the blind that he would see. He took a poor beggar and confounded the religious people of his day. And you know what this world needs to see right now more than anything is the love of God displayed through his people. This is the church's time to shine. This is our moment we've been waiting for. You know, when you look out and you hear the conversations and you just get an atmosphere of the tension of our world, you know what's missing more than anything in all of that? Love. Everybody's mad at each other. Everybody has found a very, very specific group of people that seem to agree with them, and then they're just casting fiery darts at each other. And guess what? Sometimes the church can get pulled into that. Sometimes the church can take part in the worldly battle. But you know what the church has to represent? Love unto death. We are saved, forgiven by the shedding of the blood of our Savior. You want to know who God is? It's the one who loves you more than anyone else in this world. His love demonstrated you on his cross by dying for your sins, coming to you meek and mild, his kindness leading you to repentance, his love for you covering you, saved not of your own works, but by his finished work on the cross, giving us an inheritance. This is not a paycheck. This is something he has waiting for all of us who are called his children, transferring us from a spirit of fear into a spirit of adoption. So I just want to cover those four things that I shared with you. This all starts with a revelation of God in your life. Seek him that you would find him. It is Christ and Christ alone that is the answer to the trouble of this world. Put your faith in him, put your hope in him, and love him radically. And then there is a response by faith. What is your response of faith? I shared mine, shared Abraham's. I can't share yours. I don't know what God is calling you to do to take part in the revelation of the transfer from darkness to light. Some of you need to repent from the darkness that you're tangled in, repent of it, and find the mercy that is new today. Some of you need to step out in faith. God has been calling you to something. You've just felt a little bit nervous. In the kingdom of light, he will show you what to do. His word will be a lamp unto your feet, but you must respond in faith. And then some of you need to know 
that this world will reject you, to be reminded of it, to be certain of it, and put your faith in the God who overcomes. Fear God, not man. And finally, rejoice with me, will you? As we sing this final song, we rejoice to know in my favorite aspect of this verse, cha- or chapter 1, verse 13, he has delivered us. It is a finished work. You have been given eyes to see. You already know of the future destiny that you have in Christ. Your name is written in the book of heaven. He has given you sight to see. He's given you a soft heart to receive this word. Rejoice in the finished work. Your eyes have been opened. You may have been rejected. You may be called to do things that take you way beyond what you're comfortable, but rejoice and worship him still because the work is done and you are just cashing the paychecks by the power of the Holy Spirit that God is doing in and through you. So this is why we rejoice. We pray now a revelation of God, a response by faith to what he tells you to do, a confidence in the rejection of this world, you are clinging to Christ, and a rejoicing in his spirit that nothing will separate you from the God who has taken you from darkness to light.